Welcome to Data-Driven Management of International Trade Policy During Outlier Events. My name is Firas Batarse, and I am presenting our work on behalf of the co-authors Gopinath Munasami and Ruishan Yang. Our work is concerned with applying advanced AI methods to trade policy and decision making. International economics has a long history of improving our understanding of factors causing trade and the consequences of free flow of goods and services across countries. The recent shocks to free tr the free trade regime, especially disputes among major economies, raise the need for improved predictions to inform policy decisions. Example of recent outlier events are the China shock, Brexit, and obviously the recent COVID-19 pandemic. AI methods are allowing economists to solve such issues and deal with trade and its predictions in, in unconventional ways to provide better predictions. In our work, we present novel methods that predict, associate, and classify commodities that are traded internationally. We present machine learning methods, deep learning methods, association rules, and other types of methods for predictions and associations of commodities, but also recommend causal learning, reinforcement learning, and other context-based AI methods for outlier events and understanding of their effect on the economy and on trade. If we look into the four paradigms of analytics, we begin with descriptive analytics. And in this talk, we will present some descriptive visualizations that present the world's biggest traders, the, the world's biggest trading in commodities, and so on. Diagnostic analytics is the second type of analytics that explains why something happened by looking at analysis and um, causalities. Then we also present some predictive analytics. We, we aim to predict amounts of trade and um, quantities of, of um, exchange of commodities between different countries. We present different models such as ARIMA, regression, neural networks, and multiple other ways of predictions to cover the predictive analytics aspect. But then we finally look at prescriptive analytics and we recommend policy simulations through reinforcement, lear reinforcement learning and genetic algorithms and other types of AI paradigms for that fourth type of analytics. We are all familiar with the machine learning process and how in most cases 80% of the effort is getting the data ready. The main input to a machine learning algorithm is the data. The algorithm can be fine-tuned and reorganized in a way that can consume the data in different ways. However, preparing the data is usually the biggest effort. In this study, we've collected data from multiple sources. We have scraped and gathered data from the United States Department of Agriculture, Foreign Ag Services, FAS, as well as Ag Marketing Services, AMS. Additionally, we have collected data from the World Bank, the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, of the United Nations, the World Trade Organization, and multiple other data sources. After that, we collected everything into a SQL Server, and we passed data from the SQL Server to the R client and the, and the Python engine to execute the models. We have also um, played with the Google Cloud Platform and merge that with some data sets from Kaggle and also 
tested some of those with R and Python. In this presentation, I will briefly introduce some of the models that we developed, such as regression, ARIMA, bagging and boosting, and neural networks. Historically speaking, traditional statistical models, such as the gravity model, have been used to represent and understand trade patterns around the world. However, in recent years, many countries are concerned about rising trade deficits and their implications for local employment, wages and production, and multiple other economical variables. In this study, we considered more than 30 economical variables from all countries, including GDP, population, distance, and many other economic variables. For instance, the United States goods and services trade deficit with China was $345 billion in 2019. Now, such large gaps are forcing countries to either exit trade agreements or enforce tariffs, such as Brexit and US tariffs on Chinese goods, and so on. Other events, such as pandemics and like the recent COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic, could lead to additional uncertainties in global production chains and irregularities in trade of essential goods and services. While national economic models aim to be reliable predictors and to be reliable pointers to trade, we consider the possibility that AI methods allow for better prediction to inform policy decisions. We began by building linear regression models. And so we found all the data sets that we collected and that I previously mentioned, we aggregated that data and we started building predictions for certain commodities in certain countries. For example, we developed predictions for beef and how countries like Australia, USA, and Canada trade beef. Now, most regression models give the federal analyst or the government policymaker a line that extends towards the future. And that line is usually just the line of best fit to the model or to the, to the, to the data points the historical, that represent the historical events of trade for that commodity and country pair. While regression models provide a pointer to what things look like and the trend of trade, they are no way close to being reliable predictors of trade amounts and precise values in the future. After regression, we, we tried with the autoregressive integrated moving average model, ARIMA. ARIMA gives us an upper bound and a lower bound of the forecast and we could be run with multiple probabilities like 80%, 95%, and pro provides a band of predictions, which allows for a minimum and maximum more of an underst better understanding to what trade would look like in the future based on historical data. However, still those models were not clear pointers and were not sufficient to understanding what's going on. While these models, ARIMA and regressions and other types of prediction and forecasting models use, can use multiple data points and multiple variables as inputs to the model. It's very difficult for these models to consume tens of variables and be able to provide a prediction with high quality. And so we resorted to boosting models and boosting models are based on classifications and decision trees they find weak learners in the variables that are inputted to a model and keep improving them until all inputs to the model are non-weak such decision trees allow for multiple iterations of improving weak learners and multiple iterations of improving the prediction by including more variables and including more scenarios and ending up with the best possible prediction for
commodity and country pairs. We looked at major commodities like corn, soybean, sugar, wheat, and multiple other commodities. And we predicted their trade amounts between the US and all countries of the world. And the boosting model pro provided some good predictions. However, we were not satisfied with those predictions. And given the wide amount of variables that we are using and giving the uh, multiple dimensions of our data set, we decided to pass this to a deep learning model, to a neural network. Now, deep learning algorithms are usually known for identifying images and videos and audio files, such as the image we're, that's shown right here. Deep learning models can identify objects and um, distinguish between them. In contrast to supervised learning, such as regression, unsupervised learning usually does not have a predefined response or predefined output variable, and it aims to understand the relationships amongst the observations and the variables inputted to the model. So we ran the supervised model between the years 1962 to 2010, and the testing data was run from 2011 2016. And we tried to do the same thing for the unsupervised model. The results from the supervised model, machine learning show that the models fit well in near to medium term predictions. However, for longer term predictions, unsupervised models predicted and performed much better. Now, predicting trade patterns is critical to decision making in public and private domains, especially in the current context of trade wars. And so if we look at the unsupervised model prediction results, we see how country pairs with specific commodities could be predicted with very high prediction accuracy. The models that we developed not only predicted trade amounts and values of commodities and countries, but also the decision trees provided us with very useful information in terms of which variables drive the highest amount of trade between two countries. Distance between two countries ended up being the most important variable that drives trade between countries for all major commodities. GDP of the exporter also is important. The population of the exporter and the currency of the importer or all of those are very important variables that led to understanding of trade patterns around the world. But then we went and we tried association rules. Association rules have a history of success for online and for brick and mortar co commerce. For example, Amazon's people who bought, bought this item also are interested in that item is an example of a recommendation engine that tells us what items have been bought together. Many other success stories exist, like the famous Behind Diapers Association at grocery stores, Netflix movie recommendations, Walmart's placing of bananas next to cereal, Target's prediction of pregnancy based on buying trends. For example, the famous Target story was a story that garnered national attention. It began with an irritated father entering a Target in Minneapolis, talking to the store manager, complaining about the store sending his daughter a sale booklet for baby clothes and cribs. even though the girl was still in high school. While shocked and surprised, the store manager apologized to the father and to the family because the daughter was too young to receive booklets for pregnancy and clothes and cribs and diapers and so on. Yet after a number of weeks, the store manager received a call from the father to find out that the father had talked with his daughter and discovered that she was indeed pregnant. The moral of the story is that Target knew that the daughter is pregnant based on her pregnancy prediction score and, and buying associations of commodities before she even told her mother or father. Now that sounds very dangerous. However, these models have that kind of power to associate buying patterns and different types of 
actions with other correlations such as pregnancy and other real world events in someone's life. Association rules have what's referred to as antecedents and consequence. We can see the formulas um, here for support, confidence of those rules. They just show that if someone buys commodity A, there's a high chance that it will buy commodity B. For example, if we look at bread and peanut butter, support is 60%, confidence is 75%. What this really says is that um, there's a 60% chance that 75% of the people will buy those two commodities together. Now we thought that we can do the same thing for international trade. Can we look into trade of commodities between countries and build associations that could illustrate trade associations, such as when the US exports more cereal to Mexico, Mexico will import less or no livestock and, and other animal products. We look at trade flows and aim to illustrate how the waves of trade are influenced by an increase or decrease of commodities flow between countries. We present a demo where we have collected all the results of our association, association rules model into one big data visualization. So this is an example of a predictive analytics dashboard that shows the results of association rules. We have developed associations on HS2 level for all commodities for the top world traders, China, France, Germany, Japan, Korea, Spain, UK, and the United States. Now, this here shows the consequence and antecedents of trade by commodity. And this is a confusion matrix that shows a relationship between commodities and countries and how they trade with the United States. The, if we hover over the any item on this dashboard, specifically on this correlation matrix, we can see that, for example, in this case, the country of destination is Germany. The antecedent is animal or vegetable fats, oils, and their uh, cleavage products, prepared edible fats, animal or vegetable waxes. This antecedent of trade between Germany and the US leads to a trade of aluminum and other similar, sim similar articles. And the model gives us an 81 confidence, which is, which is very high. This way we know that on this level, which is HS2, those two, those two commodity groups can be associated. Now it is highly recommended that this analysis is done on HS4 or HS6 level for policy to be driven out of such models. HS2 is a very high model, is a very high aggregation level. And so it's very difficult to um, drive specific policies for commodities. But when we go to the HS level, we, instead of talking about animal vegetable fats in general, we talk about specific vegetables or specific animal products like beef and even like frozen beef. And you, you go to multiple levels of, of sub commodities that get associated with each other, but that's part of our future work and I will present that towards the end. But this correlation matrix presents us with all the commodities and, you know, as you can tell, some of them have low confidence, like this one, apparel and clothing and its, and its association with carpets and other textile floor coverings. There's very low association between these two types of commodity groups. And so the antecedent uh, leading to the carpets consequent is um, very low and has a very low confidence. So this allows any policymaker to browse through this data visualization and provide um, analysis and insights and be able to identify certain commodities. We visualize the outputs in different ways. You know, this here sorts the, the, the different commodity groups and subgroups by confidence. And we can quickly look through only by commodity without uh, caring about the country we're trading with. As you can see, some, some of them have low, some of them have has high and so on. Um, um, 
um, across all commodities. And this is this is this number here is the sum of confidence for this commodity across all countries, which can be uh, very big. Then this is the same um, matrix, but shown in in in, in numbers and, and correlation sums. The last thing I want to show in this dashboard is a a dashboard of of all the multiple different sheets that we developed, but with this very detailed bubble chart, a world of associations, where we can see that every color is a country. The USA is at you know the the external, the outside, and this shows what the US imports from other countries. You know, if we import, uh, for example. Um, in the U.S., if we import from Japan fertilizers, there's a 60% or 65% confidence rate that we will import wood and other articles of wood and so on. And so, again, it's, it's, I can't stress enough that HS2 level is very difficult to drive policy from. However, it gives general indicators that could be then tried with HS4 and HS6 level commodities. We can see if we zoom or if we uh, zoom in and go towards the center of this bubble chart, the the purple is is um, for uh, for the United Kingdom, and we can see how uh, UK uh, doing business and trade with the United States, how certain um, certain correlations and associations are very high and others are very low, um, and and you know we will publish this tableau. A dashboard on a, on GitHub, and we welcome we welcome you to browse through and and play with it as uh, uh, you will. This is um, the you know yellow is for Spain, uh, green is for Korea, and then uh, Japan is blue. We look at Germany is 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 red, and every single data point here is an association rule. So it's every data point is not a commodity, it's not a country. It's an association rule. It's a relationship between two HS level commodities connected and associated with each other on this level. Um, orange is France, and then finally the center where we have China and, and USA, uh, Ch American exports to, to China and so on with certain uh, percentage rates. We can see some of them are low, some of them are high, um, you know, uh, and, and so on. So it really depends on the use case and the policy that you're trying to drive. But this, um, this dashboard allows policymakers to driving associations accordingly. This descriptive dashboard shows trade size between different countries across the years. And we, although we have data um, that goes before 2010, for visualization purposes, we visualized data from 2010 to 2015. Uh, we can view a, a quick summary of trade by country and how much trade they have done throughout the years. We can see every year is, is uh, uh, colored and from 2010 to 2018. We can quickly see by looking at this, the biggest traders, you know, the, the bars like jump out when compared to other, other countries. Uh, look at countries like Belgium, for example, they, they jump out very, fairly quickly. Uh, Brazil, a quick big trader, obviously China, um, a huge one, and, and so many other, Germany and France and so on. So this gives us a descriptive characterization of trade. Um, now, if we want you know, to look at how trade has been um, progressing over the years, obviously it's been... Um, increasing throughout every year we have more trade between countries but all of this is known information and and we can look at the size of trade between countries and in trillions of dollars and so on and that's fine but when we cluster countries into different groups to think of their trading power for for instance in this model if we build a five um five cluster model where k equals five and and this is based on Euclidean distances and so on, we can see that China falls into its own cluster, which is cluster number four, given its size of trade. But then countries like United States and Germany also fall into their own cluster. Then you have all the other big traders in, in red, France, Singapore, Japan, United Kingdom. And then you have cluster one has maybe the mid-size 
traders of the world, like the United Arab Emirates, India, Hong Kong, Saudi Arabia, Switzerland, Sweden, Spain, and so on. And then you have the smaller um, countries in cluster two that uh, belong to the orange uh, cluster. Now this is sized by um, the amount of trade that those countries do. And obviously we can quickly tell which countries are the biggest, but in trade policy, it's very important to understand bilateral trade. And so to do so, to do that, we have developed um, a, a, a trade dashboard that shows trade between countries in a specific manner. But before I do that, you know, another dashboard that I want to present, this one here shows the history of trade throughout the years and how it progressed, where the United States, Germany, Japan, France used to be the biggest, and China used to be in green right here, but then as time progresses, we can see China slowly sneaking into the, the, the top um, uh, position. And, and uh, you know, finally, after 2015, it, it became the biggest, um, the biggest uh, country in the world in terms of trade, followed by Germany, United States, France, and so on. Okay, so, so if we look at bilateral trade, uh, country to country trade, this map here allows us to choose a source and a destination and to look at trade between two specific countries. So if we, if we choose, for example, Austria, and we want to look how um, Austria trades with multiple countries of South America, for example, we can, we can see how um, Austria trades with multiple countries in South America um, and, and um, you know, uh, other, other places. And, and, you know, for example, Canada as well, we can unselect Canada. So we can select and unselect countries at will. If we choose any, all, you know, Central and, and South American countries, we can then um, look and, and compare how the uh, Austria trades with those countries, right? And so if we hover over any country, you can see the size of trade between Austria and that specific country. Now, for policy making um, for in trade, and say uh, you're a policy maker in Austria that wants to understand the history of trade between Austria and, and, and certain number of countries, this interactive data visualization allows anyone to look through and understand the history of trade um, between Austria and um, other countries, for example. Um, and we, we visualize here in this small uh, um, tool, we visualize the size of trade throughout the years and how it grown between the year 2010, 2018. And, and, and we intend to inject, obviously, 2019 and 20 years. The data was not available at the time we developed this dashboard, so we aim to inject further uh, more recent um, data points. If we um, choose all destinations, then we can see how you know this dashboard can allow you to browse through one country and I tr its trade with all other countries of the world, and and you can quickly compare a trade from one country to um, another and and be able to visualize that uh, quickly uh, throughout this data dashboard. However, we realize that we have to also develop models that would allow us to understand causality between different variables. So not only we include all variables, but we also need to develop models such as genetic algorithms and reinforcement learning that would present the policy analyst with multiple policy scenarios, each scenario with the pros and cons, advantages and disadvantages, that would lead to a better decision making. In genetic algorithms, for example, the algorithm can go through multiple iterations, thousands, if not millions of iterations of different scenarios and different policies with every iteration adjusting the variables slightly to achieve a, a, an optimal scenario for a policy and to achieve and be able to point to the best 
decisions that could be taken to achieve that policy. The agent keeps learning about the um, variables involved in the data set. It keeps learning about the different possible policies that could be presented. And then it reinforces its understanding and reinforces the strength of the output based on the multiple rewards and punishment actions that it receives. This way, we can present not only with one prediction or one set of predictions to the analyst, but with multiple scenarios, each scenario leading to a different outcome. Eventually, we would like to build more dashboards like we've shown in today's demo and inject, the, inject those into tractors and agriculture machinery. And we believe that such deployments will be very beneficial to decision makers, farmers, producers, and everyone else involved for better results and better policies in any country of the world. Machine learning, reinforcement learning, deep learning, and other types of models allow for simulation of trade outcomes in alternative policy scenarios. We offer a superior alternative to current approaches in public sector forecasting of trade flows. We rely on data instead of complex behavioral models with assumptions solved by accessing information from a myriad of studies. We can use artificial intelligence and data to allow for alternative and robust specifications of complex economic relationships and trade policies. Thank you for listening.